God is a good God all the time. And all the time, you ought to lift up his name and give him praise. Because he loved you first. Before you even knew who he was. He knit you together in the womb. He knows everything about you and everything about me. Can't you get with a God like that? Can't you love a God like that? Because you know, don't nobody love you like that in this world. Nobody does. Nobody can. Amen? Nobody can love us like God loves us. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see everyone today. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, ushers and all those who serve, our teachers who teach our children. Thank you so much for being here today and for, for following through with what God wants to do in your life and just making it happen. Making it happen, because that's important. Because you can say a whole lot of stuff and not do a whole lot. Amen? Amen. Making it happen. And so today, we're going to be in the book of Romans. Familiar book, familiar passage of scripture. Last week, we talked about calling on the name of the Lord. Anybody had to call on the name of the Lord this week? I did. I, I can't even tell you how many times, but I had to call on the name of the Lord this week. Amen. We ought to be thinking about calling on the name of the Lord. Whose name do you call and who do you trust and, and who do you believe on? Who do you put your weight on? In whom do you believe? We're going to be on page 782 if you have the Bible under the, your seat. Um, but the book of Romans, chapter 1, famous uh, book by the Apostle Paul. Romans Chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16. Some of you may know it by heart. When you have found it, please stand to your feet. Romans 1, 16. And it reads like this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you, God, that the gospel is the power that brings salvation to all who believes. That anyone who believes has been translated into everlasting life. Into another, another path, another, another way, your way, God. And we thank you for that today. God, we pray, God, that the word that, that you've given will be received by every single heart. And that we would all understand and grow and learn and go and do likewise. Now, let the words of my heart and the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And let everyone say, Amen. Please be seated. For I am not ashamed. Those first three letters of the sermon. The sermon title is called Unashamed, because I'm unashamed today, unashamed. Those first three letters, U-N-A, so important in the life of the believer. U-N-A, before shamed. I am unashamed, because how many of you know so many of us carry some sort of shame with us? Sometimes you can be saved and be a believer and still carry shame. But God died on the cross and took on our shame so that we didn't what? We don't have to carry that shame with us, that we can let that go. Because that's the power of God unto salvation, the shame of sin, the shame of the things that we've done, amen? That you can repent for them and God will what? Remove the shame. Because you know what? For a lot of believers and for a lot of people in the world, they carry shame for years and years and years and don't know how to let go of 
the shame. So I'm unashamed. I'm like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was unashamed. If you know his story, if you know his story and how he was a hater of Christians and how he stood by while Christians were murdered, and now he is what? Unashamed of the gospel that changed his life. Unashamed of the God that changed his life. Amen? I'm ashamed that, that God would, 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 would love him so much and would keep him to spread the gospel all over the Mediterranean. Amen? All over that area. Interestingly, the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to Rome, to the Roman church, but he had never been to Rome. Why is this interesting? Because we can see that there were many Roman Christians who had only believed in Jesus Christ because of what? Because, not necessarily because of his letter, but news had spread because of the resurrection. It's something that you can get behind and get on because you're like, well, if they believed in the resurrection and became converts because of it, how much more should we today? How much faith does that take? You weren't even there. You weren't in Palestine when Jesus walked around after the resurrection yet. Paul found it necessary to write a letter to the Roman church who were now believers when they did not see the resurrected Christ, but yet and still they believed. Amen? Amen. So, so here we have this, this letter to the Romans and Paul is telling them in this first chapter how he longs to, to visit Rome. And, you know, he, he goes into this, 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 this power of God to salvation, this power that he understands that changes hearts and a power that changes minds. And you know what? For my first, uh, my first little point here is that, you know what? The gospel wrecks your life. Because you know why? Because it wrecks your plans. Your plans. It wrecks your plans. God has great plans for us. How much, how, how, how much should we just understand that God is a great God and does all things well to get behind his plan for our lives? And he, he doesn't want to make us miserable because what? God says, I know the plans I have for you. They're, they're not to harm you, but they're for you to live abundantly. But he has to kind of over time change our minds. And it does really wreck our plans because there's some things I wanted to do because I wanted to do them. And there's some things because you wanted to do because you wanted to do them. And all of a sudden you find your life has completely changed and turned around because God is doing something different. He's taking you on a different trajectory and a different track. He's showing you how much he loves you. Is it always pain free? No, it's not always pain free. Is sometimes it a struggle? It's a struggle? Yes, sometimes it is a struggle because you know what? I want to do my way. You want to do what? Your way. But God has a better way. And so, you know, I said that he, he kind of wrecks your plans, and a lot of times we already wrecked, we just don't even know it. It's that you, we don't even know. We out there doing whatever the heck we want to do, doing things, you know, but when we first come to understand, or we first come to accept him as Lord and Savior, those desires, those things that have been kind of just eating away at our lives, they don't go away. They don't go away right away. Do your desires go away right away? They don't go away right away. We keep having stuff. We keep having the same thoughts, but God wants to do something with those thoughts. The power of God first is to save us from sin, but then it's to what? Change us and transform us. So the gospel is what? A transforming word of good news. It's transforming. If you say that you belong to God and you ain't never been transformed, there's something wrong 
with your understanding of gospel. Your understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is because he is a God who wants to transform us, to undergo a what? A metamorphosis. Undergo a metamorphosis, a change. Hmm. Y'all with me? You're with me. So we have this power of God that's able to change us, to take us from an unrighteous state and to put us into a righteous state and translate us onto a different path. And so when we're on this different path, then we have to understand that what? We have to grow in God's grace. We have to grow as believers and become Christ-like. Hmm. So I said desires don't go away. Things don't go away. Y'all think lust goes away? Lust for whatever, lust for flesh, lust for power, you think that goes away? You think things in your mind go away? You think addictions go away? You think the urge to drink goes away? You think the urge to gamble goes away? You think all that goes away? It doesn't go away. But what, what does God give us the power to do? To overcome those things. I one of the preachers this morning, he was having, he just had some staggering statistics from Newsweek and Time, and I think he used maybe USA Today. He had staggering statistics on just pornography. Just, I was like, oh my gosh. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I can't even quote the statistics to you, but I can tell you that uh, more people tap pornography than those who tap Amazon, Twitter, and something else. Some other big, big feed. For real, G Google. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Those desires and urges don't go away. But I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians, just a couple of books down the street from Romans. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And I want you to look at verse 3. I want you to turn there today. Because sometimes, you know, we stand up here and we talk about things and we talk about someone who's not, someone who's a total sinner, like Jesus did. I had to think about it first. You got to think, you die for Daryl? Um, I'm just saying, you, you know, It's a slow, he said be slow to speak. <laughs> I'm just saying, we had a God who did a great, great thing. A great thing because I don't have that perfect substance like he does. Because if you left it up to me, not many people be alive probably. How about for any of you? Just think about your whole life and who you wanted to get back at and who got on your nerves. Boop, you're done. <laughs> but that's not God's way. And aren't you so glad, y'all laughing, but aren't you so glad about it? That that's not his way that he gives second and third and fourth and 10th and 20th and all kinds of chances for us to what? Get it right. For us to get it right. He's not that kind of God. So what do you want? You want unconditional love. Love, joy. You want joy in your heart. You want to operate from a position of joy. Who wants to feel sadness or be mourning all the time? You want joy. What else do you want? You want peace. How many people are searching for peace today? How many? Just, just, just give me some peace, man. But we don't know how to do it. That's the problem, is that the world searches for peace in the world's way, and it doesn't bring about the peace that we want to have inside. Because the peace of God is that peace of God. It's like a soldier guarding your heart, walking around it all the time, so you don't have to worry about being anxious. 
Because you know that God is going to what? Take care of it. So if I say my prayers and I do it with thanksgiving and I give up that anxiety, God says what? The peace of God will transcend your heart and your mind. The peace of God will keep me. But you have to start with a B. Believe. You have to believe. What else are we, do we want? We want patience. What kind of patience, though? The patience to wait in a right way. The patience to wait in a right way. Because how many of us have waited in a wrong way? Man, go up first. In a wrong way, went and spent what I shouldn't have spent. Been with who I shouldn't have been with. Took the job that I shouldn't have taken. How many of you have made bad choices because we didn't wait patiently in the right way, which means waiting on God and his timing? You know, God's timing is never off. Our timing is always off. It can be if we're not in Christ and not waiting patiently for him to do what we need to do, what he needs to do. But we often run ahead of him. How many of you want to just be kind? Sometimes I just want to be kind to people and, you know, sometimes it's hard. And I really have to, you really have to force yourself to be, to be kind. Just to, just, because, you know, sometimes, you know, we're not in the mood. Sometimes things affect us, had nothing to do with the person, nothing at all, but just don't feel like being kind. But God can do that because we have the power of who? The Holy Spirit on the inside. Those are all the things that we want to be. How many of us want some self-control? I need some self-control. Sometimes we let the craziest things offend us. And we don't want to fix it. I ain't fixing it. She, she started it first. I ain't going to her. I just wait. Or I don't like, I don't like what he said. I don't like what my boss said. So I'm just going to be ugly. I ain't going to say good morning. I'm just going to go to work, do what I got to do, and then leave. Wrong attitude. Self, it's just... And that's not self-control, because that's not self-control in a godly way. Because God says, if you have an alt with whoever, your brother, what are you supposed to do? Go to him. Go to her. That's what you're supposed to do. But a lot of times, you know, we'll sit and stew. And won't do things like that. So those are the things that we desire from Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Do you think that if we operated perfectly in the fruit of the Spirit that we wouldn't have abundant lives? Of course we would. Of course we would. But you know what? We're not perfect people. And so God has to build character in us. He has to build it. Each one of us have different, different things that we have to deal with, but God has to build that character, and he does it by allowing certain things to come into our lives so that he can see exactly what we need and what he has to do in order to bring us in line with who he is. So how do you deal with, how do you, how do you, how do you now try to fix stuff? How do you do it? So we always say, you know what, you have to read God's word. But I'm going to give you a little formula. Not in the Bibles under your seats, but if you have a good Bible, in the back of your Bible ought to be a concordance. Or now you have Google. You can Google some stuff. So you can Google. Just suppose you're just an angry person. Every time something happens, you're off the chain. Angry. And you really want God to do something about your anger. What do you think you need to do? Go to your concordance and look up anger and look up all the verses that deal with anger. So in, in James, 
uh, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, be slow to speak and slow to anger. And so what do I do? I ask God, God help me. I want to be slow to anger. I want to do something different. I want to be at peace. I don't want to be affected all the time by what people do or what people say. I don't want to jump off and set it off all the time. I want to be somebody who's different, but you got to go to the word of God to do it. Because that's where the power is. Amen? God's word is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces through what? Bone and marrow. That's what it does. Suppose you have trouble with anxiety. Suppose you have trouble with anxiety. Just being anxious. Like I was saying before, you can go to Philippians 4, 6. It says be anxious for what? Nothing. Nothing. I can't tell you how many times just being sick and not feeling well that I started to get a little anxious. How many of you been a little anxious over, over something? How many of you? Amen. Been a little anxious for something. But he says, don't be anxious for anything. Because what? You can't do anything about it. And if you try to do something about it, maybe you're just going to make the wrong decision. So he says, by everything in prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to me, to God, with thanksgiving. He says, in the peace of God, that passes all understanding will be like a guard around your heart. Hmm. First Peter 5, 7 says, casting all? casting all your cares on him because he what? Cares for me. God, I cast all my cares on you because you care for me. There's no one who can care for me like who cares for me like you care for me. I'm going to trust you with
my house about mm, probably almost 18, 18 years ago now. And when I first moved in, I had two closets done by California Closets. And you know, they come in and they'll do your, like Closet Factory, come in and do your closet and, you know, organize it and all this stuff. Well, you know, things do change o over time. And um, I need a different kind of space. Because now the shoes are in the garage because they won't fit in the closet anymore. And then the clothes are in there and I only had shelves for shoes. And so I got more clothes now. And uh, I wanted to go through stuff and just let stuff go. But I needed another bar. I needed another bar. I need to reconfigure the closet. So I'm going to tell y'all, six months ago, I went and bought a bar so that I could hang more clothes. It's been in my car for six months. In the car, on the floor, on the, in the back seat. I was like, one day I'm gonna get to it. And she said to me, Gwen said, she said, but you haven't been able to do it. And I said, I know, but you know, if, if you know me, you know I'm like, I gotta get it done. And I couldn't do it. I really, really couldn't do it. But yesterday, God gave me some energy, y'all. He gave me some strength. Strength that I didn't have before. I was like, wow. I'm not saying I wasn't in pain while I was doing it, but I got almost three quarters of that closet done. And things hung up and things put to the side to go to Goodwill and all of that. It was just my day and the Lord, I put on some music, like I told y'all last week, so I could worship and so I could sing praise to the Lord while I was doing it because I know that even a month or two ago, I couldn't even stand up for that long. Isn't that something? That's a God who so loves me, who so loves you. It's the kind of God we serve. That's our lesson for today. Amen. Unashamed. I don't have to carry around stuff with me. I'm free to be who God wants me to be and who he made me to be. A person 